we get into the message tonight, I'd like you to think about two questions. And the first question, I'm going to try to make this a little higher so I can see it. Even with my glasses, it's still a little tough. I decided to move to 16 font, and that helps. Um, I turned 42, so there's something that happens like when you turn 42. I don't know that just like it just your eyesight changes. <laughs> I can wait. I can only imagine what will happen to my eyesight. That's it. I know lots of people are just really healthy, not just at 54, but like at 64 and 74. Okay, I'll be done with that. Um, so two questions to consider. First, have you ever been the object of favoritism? Where someone showed you favor over someone else? Maybe in a classroom setting? Maybe um, in a workplace? Or maybe um, even in your family, where you were shown favor over someone else? And what did that feel like? I mean, did it make you feel guilty? Did it make you feel awkward? Maybe you just soaked it up and you said, yeah, I, I love all this extra attention. I love being the one that's favored. Or maybe you've never been the favored one and you know the pain that goes along with that. It's funny, we were talking about this in the car on the way up here. And Rosie thinks she's not the favored one in our family, just so you know, because she has to do more dishes and feed the dogs more often than her brothers. But, <laughs> but seriously, when you're not the favored one, for real, for real, it can be really painful. What about discrimination? How many of you have ever been in a place where you felt like you were experiencing discrimination? Maybe it was because of how you looked. It could be your height or your weight, your complexion, the color of your hair. Or maybe you experienced prejudice because of your race or your ethnicity or your gender, your family's money or lack of money your athletic ability or lack of it, athletic ability. When I lived in Japan, I've, I've mentioned this before, and many of you knew I grew up, I grew up in, a, in a Navy family, so I spent several years in Japan, my seventh, eighth, and ninth grade year. And um, when we moved there, we lived on a naval base, but I went to a school, um, it was a Department of Defense school, and it was the first time in my life where I'd ever been in the minority. And less than 10% of the people who attended the school were American, either, either Caucasian or African American, and over 90% were Asian, mainly Filipino, and that's um, for a lot of different reasons. We had a, a large Filipino population. And those were wonderful years, and I, but I did learn just this little, I got this little teeny weeny taste of that feeling of being discriminated against because of, of your nationality or even because of your race. It took me a full year to, to prove to people that I could be trusted. And, and that doesn't compare at all to what people experience, um, minorities experience every day, every day in our society. So thinking about that, have you ever experienced that kind of discrimination? And what did that feel like? What, what kind of feelings did that evoke in you? Anger? Sadness? Maybe feelings of rejection and abandonment? The thing about favoritism or discrimination is that these things, they always cause pain and rejection for someone. Not making the cut, which is the name of the message tonight, not making the cut, feeling like, like you're being excluded unjustly is really hard. It's a really painful thing. In fact, some of you might be bearing the scars of those kind of experiences even right now, even today. And we know that this world can be a really mean and ugly place, right? Our world is full of sin. It's full of brokenness, and it's full of broken people. 
And so even though we always should be fighting for justice and, and treating people um, with a sense of, of fairness and equality, we know that because we live in a sinful world, that that just doesn't happen. But as Christ followers, as Christ followers, as the church, we are different. We are a very unique community that demonstrates the love, the fairness, and the justice, and the mercy of Jesus. At least that's the ideal, right? We aren't supposed to reflect our culture. We're not supposed to reflect the world. We're supposed to be a reflection of Jesus Christ and who he is. And that leads into our scripture for tonight. We're reading from James chapter 2. And I love the book of James because it is a really very practical book. It's kind of like a how to be the church kind of book. In fact, that's why um, I had to actually ask Rick, so why is there a workbench up here tonight? And it's because James is a hands-on practical guide for how to be a better Christ follower, for how to be a better church, for how to be a better reflection of Jesus. James chapter 2, and I'm reading from the message. My dear friends, don't let public opinion influence how you live out your glorious Christ-originated faith. If a man enters your church wearing an expensive suit and a street person wearing rags comes in right after him and you say to the man in the suit, sit here, sir, this is the best seat in the house and either ignore the street person or say, better sit here in the back row. Haven't you segregated God's children and proved that you are judges who cannot be trusted? Listen, dear friends. Isn't it clear by now that God operates quite differently? He chose the world down and out as the kingdom's first citizens with full rights and privileges. This kingdom is promised to anyone who loves God. And here you are abusing these same citizens. Isn't it the high and mighty who exploit you, who use the courts to rob you blind? Aren't they the ones who scorn the new name Christian? used in your baptisms? You do well when you complete the royal rule of the scriptures. Love others as you love yourself. But if you play up to these so-called important people, you go against the rule and stand convicted by it. You can't pick and choose in these things, specializing in keeping one or two things in God's law and ignoring others. The same God who said, don't commit adultery, also said, don't murder. If you don't commit adultery, but go ahead and murder, do you think your non-adultery will cancel out your murder? No, you're a murderer, period. Talk and act like a person expecting to be judged by the rule that sets us free. For if you refuse to act kindly, you can hardly expect to be treated kindly. Kind mercy wins over harsh judgment every time. Now let's keep in mind that this was written by James, who was a leader in the church in Jerusalem. Now we would assume that the church, especially the early church, they hadn't, Jesus hadn't even been gone that long. He hadn't been, had ascended very, very long. In fact, they're less than a generation away from Jesus's earthly ministry. So we would assume that church would be the place that class and race and appearance and all those superficial things that have nothing to do with character, that these would fall away and we would just um, all be equal as children of Jesus. But unfortunately, most of us know that the church also can be a sinful place. And we know that that's not always true today, and it certainly wasn't true even for the early church in the New Testament. And James is saying here that we have to own this problem. We have to admit we have an issue, we have to recognize it's an issue, and then we have to deal with it. It's critical because that's who we are as the church. So James was a leader in the church in Jerusalem, and the church in Jerusalem struggled with poverty. If you think about the Roman Empire, I mean, the Roman Empire was a very poor place. Huge disparity between rich and poor. 
There were some really wealthy people, but there were a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of really poor people. And the church in Jerusalem really struggled with finances. At one point, Paul, we know this from reading the other books in the New Testament, at one point, Paul even had to raise an offering to help the Jerusalem church. And yet, despite their poverty, James must have seen this kind of behavior, where a rich person comes into the church and the elders are like, they're falling all over him, trying to get his favor, giving him like the best seat in the house, giving him all this attention, making sure he just has every need met. You can kind of picture it. And maybe they thought, maybe they thought, well, if we make him happy, if we please him, then we'll get special favors. Or maybe they thought, if we really make him feel welcome, then maybe he'll join the church and he'll give us money and we won't be so poor. But then a poor man comes in and he looks shabby. And his clothes, maybe they're old. He's been working all day in the field. So he might smell a little bit. And by this point, the seats are all filled because he came right from work. He rushed to the church from the fields. And so the elders tell him, well, it's filled up. It's standing room only. You have to stand in the, bo- in the back or, or you can sit on the floor. They're not falling all over him. In fact, they, they take no care whatsoever to make sure he feels welcome. Rather, they kind of ignore him, hoping maybe he'll just go away. And what's interesting, I think, when you read the New Testament is the church in Jerusalem wasn't the only church that had this problem. In fact, Paul speaks to this in his letter to the Corinthians. It came to his attention that the Corinthians were allowing the wealthy church members to eat and have communion first, while the poorer poorer members stood outside and waited their turn to see if there was anything left. Now picture this. This was, this was an area where there was, there's huge amounts of poverty. Paul severely admonishes them. And he says, the whole point is you wait for all of the people to be there to gather. That this is a meal for the whole body of Christ. That you're completely missing the point. We're the church and we're supposed to look different. When we, take, when we partake of the piece of, of bread from the one loaf, we're symbolizing our union with Christ, but we're also s- symbolizing our union as the body of Christ. We symbolize that we are all together. We constitute the body of Christ, that we are, that we are equal sharers in the saving work of Christ. We profess when we, when we come to the table for communion, which we will do after this message, we profess not only our unity, but our equality in Jesus. We are all one body, and we all have equal standing in that body. And Paul emphasizes that even more in Galatians. In Galatians 3.28, one of my favorite scripture verses neither Greek nor Jew, slave nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And the reality is that we have kind of limited control as to what happens out there in the world. I mean, we can control our own behavior, and we can certainly um, do things to advocate for justice, but, but really we don't have a lot of control over what happens. But we do have control over what happens in here. As Christ followers, as members of the body, we have control over what happens here in the church. The church is supposed to be a picture of the way God intended the world. There's a, there's a um, theologian, his name is Leslie Newbigin, and he says the church is a hermeneutic of the gospel. And it's a really fancy word, but it just means the church is the embodiment of the gospel. The church is supposed to be living out the gospel message so that the world can see, so that the world can see the truth of the gospel. That the world can look into the church and see what the gospel is by our behavior, by the way we treat each other, by how we love one another. 
In fact, the church is supposed to reflect God's economy, not the world's. I love what James says. He says, isn't it clear by now that God operates quite differently? He chose the world's down and out as the kingdom's first citizens with full rights and privileges. Now, who were the kingdom's first citizens? Let's think about Jesus and the family he came from. Think about his mother, Mary, this young girl. She was probably 14. She was born into poverty. She probably didn't even own a pair of shoes. Think about that. That's how poor she was. Think about the disciples, Jesus' closest friends. They were fishermen. They were really on the low rung of society. They were poor, and yet those were the people that that he spent so much time with. Think about the people that, that Jesus ministered to. He says, the kingdom is promised to anyone who loves God, anyone who loves God. And here you are abusing these same citizens. And the amazing thing to me, I'm just, I, I, I'm always amazed when you read about Jesus and his ministry, is that Jesus clearly identifies with the poor. We as human beings, we're the ones that are obsessed with rich people. I mean, that's it. We are obsessed with power and prestige and having lots of stuff and materialism. That's our thing. Jesus, Jesus loved the poor. And you see that in scripture as you read about his ministry. He says over and over again, I love the poor. And in some scripture, he says, I am the poor. He's, if you look, think about Matthew 25 and the parable where, he's, where he separates the, the sheep from, from the goats and he says, whatever you do to the least of these, my brothers, you do to me. You do to me. Not you do for me. You do to me. When you love and care for the poor, you love and care for Jesus. So obviously, Jesus values the poor. He values everyone. In Jesus Christ, we are all equal, regardless of of where we came from, regardless of our history, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of our ethnicity, regardless of whatever it is that the rest of the world has rejected in us. So what's the solution? And James is really practical. He offers a solution. And he says, you do well when you complete the royal rule of the scriptures. Love others as you love yourself. And this isn't anything new. I mean, we've heard this directive over and over again. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. And then in John 13, Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. How do they know we're a disciple of Jesus? By how you love. So I think it probably goes without saying that we, and I say we uh, not being like us here personally, but the collective church over the centuries has failed miserably at this, right? Um, we saw that the early church struggled with this. The Methodist church has certainly struggled with this. We've had divisions over, over racism. We've had divisions during the Civil War. I'm sure New Hope in its 140-year-old history has struggled with this, has favored wealthy people over poor people, has favored um, people in a majority culture over in a minority culture. I, my guess is that's happened because, because this is a church and it's filled with people and people are sinful and people mess up. But thank God, literally thank God, throughout these times of favoritism and discrimination, 
Jesus' church still had groups of people that were rays of light that continued in Jesus' mission of love, who despite what the world said was important, they listened to the Holy Spirit and they continued Jesus' ministry of loving the poor, of loving those who were rejected by society, of loving those who were sick and imprisoned or oppressed. So, we have no control over what's been done in the past, right? Pastor Jamie often says, you can never have a better past, but you can have a better future. We can have a better future. So how can we be assured? I mean, how can we be confident that those who come to New Hope, that those who come to the table on Wednesday night are loved and accepted, are welcomed, are treated um, with a radical hospitality, regardless of who they are, what they look like, what their history is? How can we know that each and every person, each and every person who walks through our doors will know how much Jesus loves and adores them? Because isn't that our purpose? That's one of our purposes as a church. That it doesn't matter how much money you have, that it doesn't matter what color skin you have, the kind of job you have, what your grades are or were, None of that determines your value in Jesus' church. You are valuable. You are worthy. You are important because you are a child of God. God created you. God loves you. He has a purpose for you. And because of that, you are important to us. We love you. We value you. And we want you to have the best seat in the house. The best seat. So how do we communicate that? Well, first, I think we have to believe it. And not just believe it intellectually, but like just let it kind of seep into our soul. Because there's a difference between acknowledging something, yes, I treat everyone equally, than to really let it seep into your soul, into your being, into who you are. And we have to believe it of ourselves, that we're valuable, that we're worthy. And then we can believe it of others. The world values money and power, but Jesus' church, in this church, in this place, we value every human life, every child of God. So let this church truly be a place of new hope where all are welcome, and where we are a picture of the way God intended his body to be. And so I have two questions. I'm going to close with two questions tonight, because I think this is really difficult. This is hard stuff. And we all come from a different place with different histories, different experiences in the church with discrimination, with rejection, with favoritism. And we know, we know what's expected, but how do we behave? So can you personally reflect the love, the unity, the equality of Jesus in your own life? Can you personally do that? Not just here at church, but in all you do. And maybe you've struggled with this, and that's okay, because the awesome thing about God is you can repent and you can make a change right now. So that's the first question I want you to think about and reflect on. Can you do this? Will you do this? Will you commit to doing this? And second is, how can we, as the body of Christ, how can we as the table, as this worshiping community, how can we live this out? And make sure that every single person who walks through those doors, who joins us at dinner, feels welcome. No matter what. How can we, how can we show them and demonstrate and live out the values of Jesus? How can we show them that they are worthy, that they are valuable? 
So I want us to just take a few moments and we're going to be silent. We're going to pray and just reflect on this. And then I'll close in prayer. Okay. Oh God, we know that you love us and you value each and every person. You value each and every person in this room. You value each and every person in Brandon. And we, you value each and every person in this world. But sometimes we don't. Sometimes we fall short. And for the times that we have fallen short and we have shown favoritism or we've been discriminatory or, or been um, rejected people because of things they had no control over, God, we are sorry. Please forgive us. And help us do better. Help us be the kind of people that demonstrate your love and your acceptance and your generosity and your mercy in a way that points other people to Jesus, that alerts others to the reign of Christ in this world. And help us as the table be the kind of place where everybody is offered a front row seat. God, we just pray that, that we can be a picture of your gospel, that we can be a picture of your kingdom in a way that makes a difference for Brandon. Because I know there are hurting and broken people out there and they need you and they need your people and they need the church and help us be the kind of church that can respond to that need. Bring them, Lord, bring them here and help us love them. And we pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen.